Hi, my name is Jeremy Shines, and this is I Am Loved Church. Good morning, everybody. What a life. (laughs) Okay, let's jump right into it. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the people who are tuning in. We thank you for this rehearsal. If no one isn't, (laughs) that's okay. And uh, I can't thank you enough for all that you've done and you continue to do. Father, humble me each and every day, every morning, as I pray to you, Father, as we pray to you in this moment, that you would empty me of myself and you would fill me with you. I lay it all before you, Father, that I can't do life without you. I don't know what to do, where to go, who to be, who I am without you. I have no peace without you, Lord. I have no love without you. I am not good without you. I know who I am that I'm a wretched sinner, but I'm saved by your grace. Not anything that I can do, but that what you already did on that cross when you died for not just my sins, but all of our sins, and that we can only just believe it and receive it. Father, I pray that whoever's listening or watching, that they would believe and that they would receive and that they wouldn't hear me, but that you would use these lips as you use your word to speak truth that you use people father sinful people to glorify your perfection that you can use anything you can redeem anyone and anything father i thank you and i pray that whoever's watching or listening would have some impact and that would hear from you today in jesus mighty name amen Wow, what a life. Okay, so the topic today is scapegoat. Scapegoat. What is scapegoat? For those of you who don't know, most of you should know what it is. Um, Or scapegoating. What scapegoat basically means um, is to shift the blame to someone who's innocent or something. It doesn't have to be a person. It can be even an object. To give a reason why. To justify oneself. Well, we all like to justify. I love justifying myself. (laughs) And in God's eyes, none of us are just. None of us deserve or have a good enough excuse for really anything that we do. But we continue to do it. And to justify yourself, which basically means is to shift the blame, whether it's to some person usually or some event or some circumstance or some object. I did this or because of this. Um, I failed because of this person or it's this person's fault. And for those of you who don't know, the scapegoat takes all the blame. Usually, the scapegoat is usually the black sheep of the family or of the job environment or gets blamed for everything and this person cannot do anything good. In in everyone's eyes, this person is a failure and, and the scapegoat eventually starts to even feel this way, to be blamed and accused for everything, like they can do no right. Maybe you're the scapegoat, maybe you're the accuser. Maybe you're someone, you're, you've always, we've all played this role, the scapegoat, or we've all been the justifier, fire. we've all played a part in someone or another, but today we're going to focus just mostly on the scapegoat. Uh, we're going to go way back, as usually, uh, back to the context or the scriptures of the Bible, the oldest written documents that we have found. And those of you who don't believe that, well, it is the oldest written document that human beings have a record of. And you're saying, how? It's been rewritten multiple times. No, it's been retranslated multiple times. Just like, take Batman or Superman, uh, 
or an Aven- Avengers. Uh, the original story is there, but people remade it over and over and over again to be able to convey the same meaning or the same message of uh, human sacrifice. There needs to be a sacrifice. Someone has to take the blame for all this dysfunction in our world or dysfunction in ourselves or dysfunction in our family. You know, and usually the superheroes of the things that we love the most, they are portraying biblical truth. In other words, it's an allegory or a metaphor or an analogy or a, uh, I think it's called idiom. It's a story to convey a deeper meaning or truth. Or you can just read the Bible. (laughs) There's lots of truth. Even for those who don't have the Bible, there's truth everywhere. Not everything is truth, but God is constantly speaking to the non-believer and the, and the believer. And we need to open our ears, open our eyes, open our hearts and our minds to receive the truth. Beyond all that, let's go right back into the scapegoating. The scapegoat is a person who takes the blame because there needs to be when there is a, when you break a law, when there is a trespass against boundaries or a trespass against some sort of um, law, moral, ethical, uh, conscious, um, written code, there's a straight line. And if you, if you don't walk according to life, according to this straight line, and you're walking um, outside of it, which basically means it's not always bad first off but in this particular sense when we're talking about the bible it is bad when god told adam and eve not to partake of the fruit and they broke his commandment they basically rebelled against him and there needed to be punishment there needed to be blame there someone needed to be guilty of of this trespass And so much in human history since that moment, we see people not being responsible for their choices. They're shifting the blame to other people, usually people who have nothing to do with what happened or don't even know they're being accused or not at fault. And we see Adam, who's one of the last things that God uh, created as far as like, Uh, After he created everything, he created human beings. And Adam was the first human being. And he was held responsible. Not Eve. Yes, Eve too, but she was punished as well. But Adam was punished uh, worse than Eve, I guess. I don't want to get into all that theological debating, but Adam was punished. So if you're a leader or you're um, above people in some not above better, but if you're responsible and you have responsibilities and you're not doing your responsibilities to the best or to uh, its standard, then you will be held more accountable than the people who are that you're in charge of. Not beneath you, like you're better than them, but that you're in charge of. And Jesus says, uh, he who is responsible with little will be responsible with much, but he who is responsible with much and is not doing he or what she should be doing will be punished with great punishment. See, a lot of things we want, we want to be blessed in this world, but we, we need to be responsible. I keep jumping away from scapegoating, but Adam was not responsible. And instead of taking the responsibility, when God said, you broke this commandment, he shifted the blame to Eve. Yes, she originally partook of the fruit, but he was held responsible. And then she shifted the blame. She copied him. You see, in our, if you want to be a leader or you are put in a position of leadership, if you're a man, you're a natural born leader. That's just the way it is, according to the Bible. And whether you like it or not, you're going to be taken, you're going to be the one responsible. And what's bad about this world is we have some bad leadership. Well, given because we're all sinners, but we have some, you won't get away with, with your wrongdoing. 
according to the Bible, everything will be found out. You will be found out for who you really are, regardless, even if you try to hide it. And that's all politics really is. And, and it's just sh being able to shift the blame. You may get away with it in that moment, but you will be found out eventually. So we need a cure for being able to shift, for not shifting the blame. The scapegoats are being blamed for things they didn't even do. People are being blamed for things they had no responsibility over, no control over, but this person who was in charge or this person who uh, committed an, a sinful action shifted the blame. And usually that looks like blaming other people for really anything and everything. Oh, people always do this, or people always do that, or people are this and that and this and that. Well, what the Bible says is, judge not that you not be judged. For what judgment you judge, you shall be judged, and the measure you use shall be measured to you. So what I'm saying is this. Paul says, before you cast judgment, discern for yourself if you commit those sins, if you're the one trespassing against other people. You who say don't gossip, do you gossip a lot? You who say don't worry, do you worry a lot? You who steal, do you steal? You know, and he's saying we need to analyze ourselves before we commit a sin because one of the things that God loves to do, which what I mean loves, it doesn't love it, but what he's justifiably going to do is he's going to spiritually blind us. So the things that we hate about people is usually the things that we're doing in ourselves. And instead of taking responsibility for our own actions, what we're going to do is we're going to accuse people because we're spiritually blind, blinded by seeing it in other people because we're the ones committing that sin. So then you get a bunch of people who are always complaining about multiple things. They're always like this, 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 and this, and this. And God's like, look at your own heart. And when you can identify it, and when you can humble yourself, allow God to open your eyes to identify the problem is inside of you, then you can take responsibility. But this is what spiritual blindness is referred to. People not taking responsibility for their actions, things that they say, things that they think, things that they do. And God is calling us to do that, to take responsibility. So usually what happens is when the person committed the sin, Instead of humbling themselves and being corrected and asking for forgiveness and not doing it again and looking at their own self, what they would do is they would shift the blame to the scapegoat. When the scapegoat gets blamed, what then happens, they are being accused of something they don't feel like they're at fault for when they shouldn't because they're not at fault for it. So then they're angry and what do they do? They become an accuser themselves and they start to accuse the person back and then and then they become as guilty as well. And they become the, scape, the, the scapegoats, the scapegoat. But there is fault at hand. And God will bring justice to both the accuser and to the scapegoat. So for the scapegoat, what is the antidote for the scapegoat? The antidote is what Jesus did. Jesus was the ultimate scapegoat for humanity. In the garden, Adam and Eve sinned. doesn't matter whose fault it was. They sinned. One sinned, accused the other, wasn't the other's fault. They both became guilty before God. Both parties are wrong because there's only one who's perfect, and that's God. And he made himself in the likeness of Jesus. And he says, he who, ha he who is without sin casts the first stone. So I know what you're thinking. You're just like, oh, I'm making these videos and I'm judging everybody. Yes, I will reap what I sow. What I, how I treat people will eventually come back to me. That's why you have to make sure your heart is in the right place. But Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he gives that same spirit to those who believe in him and those who do preach truth from their heart. You see, and what I reap is what I sow. So I want to teach my neighbor truth because I want truth in return. Because where there's truth, there's life. And that's what God says. And there's blessings and there's true joy and happiness. For those who don't want to listen to the truth, they don't want to see the truth. They shut their eyes, their ears, their minds, and their understanding, their heart. They shut it off, and they don't want to hear it. That's why I know I'm not surprised that I don't get much views on my thing, because I'm always trying to deliver the truth. The truth is in God's holy word. Have I been a scapegoat before? Yes. Do I play that role? Yes. Do I play the accuser role? Do I play the blame game? And when I do something wrong, I shift it to people? Yes. We all do it. But when we recognize it, we're supposed to repent of our sin and not do it again and be more aware the next time. If you get pulled over for speeding, 
you're supposed to say, I'm sorry to the officer, repent of your sin. If he lets you go, praise God, that's grace. And even if he doesn't, you're supposed to learn from your mistake and you're supposed to not do it again. A fool doesn't listen to advice and goes right back to doing it again and again and again. Are these sins going to happen again and again and again? Yes, but is there going to be some deep remorse inside of one's heart? heart to finally go, I need to learn. I need to start being aware. I need to start treating my neighbor how I want to be treated. And and I can't just do whatever I want whenever I want and treat people however I want and shift the blame to whomever I want. I guarantee you, you will be alone and a sad person in your life if you do this. And God will not approve of you or accept you. You see, he can see our hearts. He can see our minds. He sees our past every single moment of it. And we're feeling the weight of God upon our life because of the weight of sin. And he's saying, I can set you free. I can forgive you and I can heal you. But you have to set your eyes on me. You have to do what's right. If you sinned, you need to repent of your sin. If you are the scapegoat, you need to forgive the person who scapegoated you. You see, God is saying, all humanity is guilty before my eyes, whether you're the scapegoat or whether you're the accuser. But I'll have no part of any of you until both of you humble yourself and come before me and let me teach you and guide you. He says, justice is mine. For those of you who are scapegoated, you feel like you're the black sheep of the family. You probably are. You feel like you're the black sheep of your job or, the, or even the social system in this world. You probably are. I guarantee you everyone feels the same way. There's nothing uncommon to man that we're not all going through. We all go through anxiety. We all go through uh, bitter and jealousy. We all go through unforgiveness. We all go through all the same commonalities in different ways. But God says, I don't care if you were born into a world because I put you into your family, into this world, into this generation at this time in life. I did this. So if there's anyone to blame, it's always going back to the beginning where Adam and Eve, who created all this life, who allowed it to happen? Well, God allowed it to happen. So if you're blaming anyone, if you're the scapegoat of anyone, you're not the ultimate scapegoat. Jesus paid the penalty for sin. Jesus died on the cross so humanity can be forgiven and not only be forgiven, they can be set free and they can learn wisdom to walk in truth and not walk in lies or walk in sin and live immorally like most people live immorally. They have no reverence for each other. They have no fear for God. They have no empathy for each other. They always looking at what they can get from one another or what what people owe them. Uh, They think life is all about them. You see, in the last days, they say that people will will not love each other anymore. They don't have the natural love for each other anymore. They'll need alcohol or some sort of drug or some sort of something else. It won't be a natural childlike, holy, what God provides for us or when we're all children. When we were all children, it won't be natural anymore. It'll, it'll have to be because of something else, and it won't be because of God anymore. So the scapegoating thing is I, for, for me in my life and testimony, is I've felt like I've scape, been scapegoated a lot of times. And, and quite honestly, I get scapegoated still on a regular basis. Does it piss me off? Yes. Does it make me want to do some horrible things, whether physically or think uh, horribly? Yes, it does. But at the end of the day, I remember that Jesus paid the penalty for sin and he was without sin. This was an old Jewish uh, way, uh, tradition, when they were sacrificing animals. What they would do is they would get a goat who was basically perfect, meaning it wasn't without sin. It didn't it, it was uh, perfect in God's eyes. It, it, animals don't sin for the most part, because they don't have, I don't know if they have free will or not. That's another (laughs) topic. But uh, we have sin. And all the people would, the priest would put his hand on the goat's head. They would have two goats and they would cast lots, like basically roll dice and say, which goat is going to be sacrificed uh, for the people? And this goat had done nothing wrong. And this is probably why like satanic stuff is so it got whatever it is with the goat head and all that but they would get the goat the 
innocent goat or sheep, but usually in this sense because it's scapegoat topic. They'd get the goat, and it was a goat. They'd get the goat, and they'd put the, their hand on the goat. And they would roll dice. So which goat it's going to be? They would choose one. Oh, it's this goat because of what the dice said for some reason. They'd put their hand on the goat. The priest would would basically put all the sins. They would be. It's it's a symbolic metaphor, but God would be watching from heaven, and and He would accept this as an offering. And they would get all the sins of the people. Every bad thing everyone's done, whether watch porn, whether not worship God, whether stolen, or whether have looked at people who weren't their spouse with lust. I mean, if you're not even married, yes, looking at a woman or a man who's not your spouse and thinking sexually, whether they've cursed. I mean, every sin is a weight. And they would put all their sins on this goat. And what they would do after that is they would, they would, I don't think they would kill it. Uh, I haven't done too much research on it. But what they would do is they put all their sins on this goat and they would let it off in the wilderness to run around. And I think three things happened to it. Either the goat went into the wilderness and it was killed or it never came back and eventually was purified or it came back and they had to kill it or something. I don't know. Either way, this innocent goat had taken all the blame for something it never had even done before. It was completely innocent, like a baby. Brand new baby. Can you imagine that? You get a brand new baby, like, oh, it's baby. Wow. And, and all the people, imagine all the political things that are going on in the world, all the evil things you see on TV on a regular basis or history, including like you know, Nazi Germany, all of that, you know, concentration camps, all that, all your dirty stuff, you know, all of it. You see this innocent baby and, 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 and you just put all your sins on it. it. Just It's the baby's fault. And they take the baby and they basically kill the baby. I mean, your mind as well be dead if you're if you've ever felt guilty, if you've ever committed sin, now all that gait and the, uh, all that sin and weight on you, it just, oh, and it makes you, I've wanted to be suicidal. I've tried to kill myself a few times because I felt so guilty for my sin. Maybe you're there. But God so loved us. He sent his only son. We no longer have to sacrifice animals anymore. So if you're seeing that, it's a lie. And God sent his only son who was perfect. Who, who lived perfectly, who showed us how to live, who continues to show us how to live, who died for our sins. He loved his neighbor as he loved himself. He did what was right all the time, all the time. We'll never meet a new, another human being like that ever. He did what was right all the time from his youth all the way up to the day he died. He was brought into this world to take the punishment of sin upon himself. So none of us can earn it. So we try to earn it. We feel guilty and we try to earn it. We try to do what's right, but we can't. The Bible says we can't do what's right because we're weighted with sin. We can't do a bunch of good things to fix our karma. Our karma is constantly reminding us. It's, it's not even karma. It's, which, it's sin. <laughs> That's like another religion nonsense. But it's sin. It just constantly reminds us every day. You wake up. It reminds you of all your sins. The demons get to come and torture you every day. You're like, oh yeah, every day. You're literally in hell. Like, <laughs> when you sin against God, your sin is is constantly being tormented. Demons constantly tormenting you, reminding you every day for the rest of your life to the day of eternity, forever and ever, reminding you what you did was wrong reminding you that you shifted the blame. And no matter how many times you accuse people, your sin will never wash away. You'll be reminded every day of what you did, every day for the rest of your life. You're living in the judgment right now. Right now. Every human being, including myself, if I sin, every human being is living in the judgments of God right now. So when we see all these viruses and these diseases and these things and these earthquakes going on and these murders and all this stuff, people are burdened by sin right now. The righteousness of God is revealed from heaven. Right now, they're living in the judgment of what they've done. And that's why you see people mad and upset and angry. 
Because God is like, uh, unless, I, I don't want to accept your deeds. I don't want to accept your, all your good like donations and your money can't buy it, your freedom. Your, and all these people are trying to buy it. They're trying to earn it. They're like, maybe if I do enough good stuff, maybe if I do this and this and that, maybe if I'm the most popular, or maybe if I get all this money, I'll finally have the healing that I need. Or maybe if I sit in this like crazy like jacuzzi thing, it'll finally heal my body. But God's like... The only thing that can heal your soul is the blood of the lamb. The blood of the lamb. It's like, it's a ram. A ram is a goat or a lamb. It's a ram that was sacrificed. And that's the only thing that can heal you. And the only one who can give it to you is God Almighty who created all things for his pleasure because he's good. And he has to release it from heaven. He has to pour it out in the spiritual realm through your being to cleanse you of it. And until he does that, until he sees that your heart, until he sees that you in from within your heart, believe that his son died for your sins until he sees within your heart that you are in remorse, that you are like, Oh, please heal me and really mean it from your heart. Because a lot of people pretend to mean it, but they don't mean it and they never feel it. Oh, I've read the Bible and I've cried out to God and he didn't work because you didn't mean it. Until he finally sees that your heart is breaking like his heart breaks for this world and it's sin. Unless that really happens in deep in your heart, it doesn't happen in your mind. It happens in your heart. It accesses through your mind, but it happens in your heart. Until God sees that, he won't send his son's blood to wash you of your sin. So, you can't know how to do it. So how do you do that? How do you get there? You got to read the Bible every day. Read the Bible every day is the best way I know how. Pray to him every day. Every day, live, surrender your whole life to him. And he will send his son's blood to wash you of your sin. And you will feel like a child again. You won't feel judged anymore. You will feel whole. You will feel peace. You will feel loved and accepted by God. You're not accepted because you sinned against God. No matter what this world tells you you need to do to be accepted, it's because of sin. It has nothing to do with the way you dress or look like or all this other stuff. It has everything to do with you don't worship the one true God. You have sinned against him. You don't fear him. You don't follow him. You don't do what he wants you to do. The reason why you woke up today is because he allowed you to wake up today. It doesn't matter whether you're a scapegoat or whether you're the accuser. You shifted the blame. It doesn't matter who you are. You sinned against God and God doesn't accept that. The only person he accepts are those who are perfect. I'm not perfect. I know someone who is perfect who died for my sin. And he says, until you accept Jesus as being perfect, I won't see you as I see Jesus. So we need to accept Jesus. And when we accept Jesus, his holy perfection comes over us. And then God sees us as our, as his own. He imputes to us. So I want to give you this last analogy, what a impute means, to impute something, which would mean that I have two children, right? I have two daughters. In other words, if Joy comes to me, which is my oldest, and says, I want to give my bicycle to her sister, which is the youngest, Lily, and I say, sure. So I, I think mentally or heart-wise, whatever, I'm playing the role of God. And I say, okay, so I impute Joy's bike to Lily. Now, if Joy comes to me another day and says, I want my bike back. And I say, "Uh uh-uh, that's not your bike no more. That's Lily's bike. You see, I make a change. I still know Lily's Lily. But I make a, a spiritual change to say this is imputed to Lily. From joy. Now, joy, let's just say, represents Jesus, represents Jesus Christ. And Lily represents sinful, a sinful person, sinful human beings who can never be made perfect in the eyes of God. And by Lily believing that joy gave this free gift of salvation to her, I 
I, who am representing God, see that Lily believes in her heart, and I give and I impute this righteousness onto her. That's it. That's how you. That's how you have salvation. That's how you get forgiven of your sins. That's how you know that God loves you and, and, and wants you and accepts you and gives you peace. But the moment that Lily thinks that she can earn this bicycle is the moment that I re reject her again. Because then I see her for who she really is again. Sin, uh, uh, a, a sinful person. So God sees us as a sinful person. He sees, no, you're trying to earn my love. You're trying to earn my acceptance. You're trying to earn it instead of accepting this free gift that I've already given to you. Your heart needs to accept that Jesus died for your sins. Your heart needs to accept Jesus. Your heart needs to trust in Jesus. Your heart needs to love Jesus. Your heart needs to believe in Jesus. And until you believe and trust and hope and follow Jesus, then this righteousness and holiness and perf perfectness won't be imputed to you in God's eyes. I hope that made sense. So with all that being said, it doesn't really matter who the scapegoat is. It doesn't really matter who the accuser is or the golden child or the narcissist is. What matters is what Jesus did. That's it. Because we've all been the scapegoat. We've all been the, uh, the golden child at one point. We've all been the narcissist at one point. We've all been the accuser. We've all done wrong in God's eyes. And God is the one who justifies. He's the only one who justifies. He justifies us. We can't justify ourselves. We can't make a good enough excuse. We can't live good enough for, to, to be justified before God, the holy God who's perfect. He's the one who does it. And he wants to see our hearts believe it. And until we get our hearts, until we like get in front of ourselves and see, us, see ourselves for who we really are in front of a mirror or spiritually and say, I'm a dirty, nasty sinner. I can do nothing right. I can think no good. I'm always running towards evil. I cannot depend on my own opinion. I am, I am unrighteous. And then we can start to see, we need to see that for ourselves, in ourselves. We need to really not trust in ourselves. The Bible says he who trusts in himself is a fool. And the Bible also says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. All have gone astray. All have rebelled. There's none who does good. No, not one. The Bible says that uh, everybody does this. They're self-righteous. They're right in their own eyes, which means that they think that they can do no wrong. They think that, oh, and that's, that's this, he, God is describing our human nature. He's saying, we think that we can do no wrong. So when someone tries to correct us, we go, no, I'm right. And we argue and we fight. And this is the world that we live in. And he gives us to our desires. He says, go ahead, act that way. Go ahead, be this way. But you'll never have enough. You'll never be enough. You'll never have peace. But God says, he who, he or she, whoever recognizes that they're just what the Bible describes, what God describes as being dirty and nasty and unholy and unperfect and can never do any right, who humbles themselves to who they really are in God's eyes and recognizes that they're evil and they're always going to be evil. Not always, but who are, who are evil, who recognize that they need a savior. Do you need a savior? I need a savior every day. I need help every day. And I realize I can't depend on myself. I can't depend on the way I think. I can't depend on anything that I do because I'm not good. I'm not perfect. I'm not God. I need a God that is those things. And the Bible describes there's only one God who's this way and who's loving and holy and perfect. And he loves me even though I do sin. But he wants to see me grow and he wants to see us learn and he wants to see us walk in truth and he wants to see us stop going back into those lifestyles or behaviors. 
So the question is, are you and I willing to stop making excuses? Oh, I'm the scapegoat. I'm the victim. Or this person and that person, whatever area of your life you're in. Are we willing to just lay it all down and just say, you know what? I can do no good. I can do no right. And finally come before the Lord and say, you know what? Who are you? Who do you say about me? And who are you? And what do you say about yourself? I want to know who you are, God. And he already showed himself. He said, it's in Jesus. Look at Jesus. That's who I am. Who I am, the humanity, is, is who, when we look at Jesus, we look through the Gospels, we see this character, Jesus, and how he treated people, and how he, how he did things, and what he did, and how he spoke, and we see the character of God. God is love, when we look at Jesus. So we can't compare ourselves to anyone else, these Christians, or lives, or this and this, we just look at Jesus. Don't, don't look at all the Christians, because we're all still sinful. We all make mistakes, still. But take your time and actually read the Bible. You can't make it a judgment about who Jesus is if you've never read the Bible. You don't even know who that is. You heard of his name. But look for yourself. What does the Bible say about Jesus? And it'll show you right there. That's who Jesus is. Watch how he moves. Watch how he talks. Watch what he does, how he does it. Watch what's more, most important in his life. And how he treats people. And we are supposed to imitate that as the church. We're supposed to imitate Jesus, not in ourselves. But we're supposed to imitate means to really hang out with. You, who you spend time with is who you start to act like. If it's, it's what kind of TV shows you watch and the, these, these people who talk the way they do, and, or whether it's music or whether it's the people you socialize, your family, anyone you spend time with the most, you start to imitate. So if you spend time in God's word, you start to imitate that. You want to find God, go to the Holy Bible. <laughs> He's always there. Someone's always trying to get you to the Holy Bible. There's a Bible everywhere. But we like to spend more time with everything else. And then we imitate that. And our reflection of our life starts to imitate that too. And we attract those kind of people. And we attract that kind of lifestyle and behavior and way of thinking. And that's why we're in hell. Because we sin against God. when we don't know what the Bible says about sin and what sin. When we go and do things for ourselves, we don't con consult with God. And we make bad choices and we think that, oh, God must be a bad God because my life is terrible. And he's like, I'm not doing any of the stuff that you're accusing me of doing. That's all on you. You're the one making those choices. You're the one sinning against me, not knowing what right and wrong is, what the Bible describes as right and wrong. You're the one worshiping idols. You're the one who made these false religions. You're the one who's doing these things. I'm trying to help you, but you keep turning my words against me, or trying to understand them without my Holy Spirit. You're, you're the one trying to interpret my word according to what you want with your agenda. Right? You need to take off your agenda. You need to see the Bible for what it really is. It's God's holy word. There are things that I don't like about it. But then I look at it more and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is good. I'm evil. God knows what he's talking about. He knows what he's doing. He knows how to do it. So when we look at the world, I look at the world through God's eyes because I say I empty myself. I put my trust in Jesus. He fills me up with his eyes, with his ears and understanding. I don't understand everything, but I can definitely see God working everywhere. I can see him working in the clouds. I can see him working between people, even though they can't see him. I can see him working in every in any situation in my life, in myself, everywhere, because he's amazing and he's good. and He loves you and me. I'm done. <laughs> so, a scapegoat. There is no greater scapegoat besides Jesus Christ. And he rose from the dead. So, with all that being said, let's pray. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for everything that you do. I thank you for your ultimate scapegoat, which was Jesus who died for our sins, who was perfect and unblemished and without sin, who was pure. And he lived a good life. He was the reflection, the image of God himself in the flesh. Father, we can't thank you enough. You are amazing. You are holy. And you are good at the same time. <sighs> we pray that we would trust in you. We would 
we would melt for you. We would believe in our hearts and in our minds that you are the one true God and that we can't earn it, that we can only trust that, that we are accepted when we accept Christ. And we're not ashamed of him. Father, many people are ashamed of you, Lord. They're ashamed of even saying the name of Jesus. They will say God before they say Jesus. Father, we pray that we would not be ashamed of the name of Jesus Christ. We would not be ashamed of who he is. We would lift him above every name in this world, every idol in this world, Father, because Jesus lifted up our sins so we may lift up him and we may be forgiven. In Jesus' name, we pray for anyone and everyone who's heard this message. We continue to stay tuned, Father, uh, and we continue to believe and continue to just ask you, Father, to reveal yourself, ask you for whatever they need, Father, but ask of right motives, not of wrong motives, Lord. And they would read their Bible on a regular basis. They would pray to you on a regular basis, not religiously and routinely and saying the same things over and over and over again, but they would say things authentically with what, you're, what they're really going through because you want to hear that. You want to know that. You want to hear them speak. You love your children. You love all of us, even though we don't deserve it. We thank you so much in Jesus' name. We thank you for tuning in. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray that God would do some things and he would alleviate the doubt in your heart. He would, he would just show you more of who he is. And if you don't have a relationship with him, you can message me personally uh, or, you know, we can go from there. Thank you so much. God bless.